Okay, a few things on the agenda. Um, I know there's a couple things that I had on the, the official event. I've evolved the concept since then um, because originally it's going to be a one-off webinar or a two-off webinar, if you will. And there was a really good response last week, so I feel like perhaps people actually might want to ask any questions and list the answers instead of this being a webinar. Um, this is now Michael Whitehouse Live. Welcome to the first episode of Michael Whitehouse Live. Also, I uh, put out on Facebook, what's your response to the word webinar? And I got some great reactions. I'm actually going to, uh, let me see if I can share a couple of those with you because they are totally worth a moment to take a look at if I can find them. So give me one second there because this is normally, I well, really I should have prepared and I should have looked ahead of time. and and uh, found this before before I went live, you know, while I was goofing around for like the last 10 minutes, but that's okay because you'll love this. It'll be great. It'll be great. We're almost there. Almost there. Searching, searching, searching. Okay. So I, I asked on Facebook, when you hear the word webinar, um, you got a couple, you know, sitting at a desk and being bored. Lexa Grumpy, thought was good. Waste of time or infomercial, groan, yawn. Um, sitting at a desk while someone someplace else reads me a PowerPoint that I could easily, that could easily have been emailed to me. One of my favorites, awkward portmanteau is one of the best. Um, which I thought awkward portmanteau would be a great name. Um, spam. Going to my going to a seminar in my pajamas, which if you're watching my webinar in your pajamas, that's totally cool. I don't judge. Web seminar, well, that's obviously exactly what it is. Uh, a tech headache and some sort of impending impending failure. That's a great answer to what a webinar is. And um, an arachnid learning to lecturing to a captive audience. Thought that was good. Uh, my favorite one, another one of my favorites was also BS that you pay for, which I pointed out. It's very important that I do change the name of this from webinar because this is BS that you don't pay for. Well, hopefully it's not BS. Hopefully you'll find it valuable. Um, the previous two minutes have been BS, but hopefully the rest of this you will find valuable. So a couple things we're going to be talking about. Uh, we're going to talk about obstacles versus excuses. We're going to talk about how to approach people at a networking event or even just in a business environment, how to open a conversation. Uh, we're going to talk briefly about WIFM, what's in it for me. Uh, I did put out a blog about this today, which you can read. I was going to uh, post like the video, and then I realized I didn't do a video. I just did a blog post. And, uh, so, But if you go to michaelwhitehouse.org, that is the most recent blog post, so read that. Um, also, I'll talk about the, the giver's gain concept, giving value, um, something that Gary Vaynerchuk refers to as jab, 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 right hook. And we uh, may go over the seven steps of the sale, because I did promise that in the, in the promo for this. Um, so if there's time, we will be going over that. So those are the things we will be talking about. So the first thing I want to talk about is obstacles versus excuses. So a lot of people I talk about, they, they could do something. They should do something, start a business, or maybe change jobs, or even leave a relationship, whatever. That there's some change that they should really make, but they don't make it. And it's usually because of some kind of excuse. You know, oh, I, I can't do that. I don't have the money. I can't do that. I don't have the connections. I can't do that. I'm, I'm not ready. I'm going to wait for, you know, wait for the summer. I'm going to wait for the fall. I'm going to wait for the winter. I'll wait for the spring. It's spring now. But for some reason, they're going to wait. Now, sometimes it's demographic. What I call it demographic excuse. That they will say that... Uh, you know, either they're minority, woman, gay, tall, short. Some description of them makes it difficult or impossible for them to pursue their dream, pursue the plans that they have. Um, sometimes it's, it's some other excuse. They don't have the connections. They don't know the right people. Now, there are certainly reasons why you can't make the leap. If you are the sole income, or, or sole income earner for your family, and you're thinking about going off and starting a business, and you're quitting your job, risking everything and starting a business, well, that's a big chance to take when you're responsible for other people. 
So that may be something where you want to incrementally move into it. You know, do it after hour time, but still keep the main job so that uh, so you can still take care of the family. But that's not an excuse for not doing it. That's just an excuse for not doing it whole hog. But whenever you're looking at a reason why you can't do something, you need to think about, is this an obstacle or is this an excuse? Now, if it's an excuse, you just need to push it aside. If it's an obstacle, you need to figure out how do you get around it? You know, one thing that I, I ran into, I've been looking to get into training, you know, sales training, motivational speaking, that kind of thing, for a number of years. And about two years ago, I, I made, a, made an effort to get into it. And I was not successful because I wasn't able to make the connections. I wasn't able to, to spin it the right way. It wasn't that I didn't have the knowledge because other than a bit more lived experience in the sales business. Excuse me. <coughs> I better get a blessing of a Facebook message there. Anytime now. Just kidding. No, seriously. Someone should say bless you in like a YouTube comment. So, you know, it, academically, I knew almost as much about sales then as I do now. Uh, hadn't encountered Gary Vaynerchuk yet, but Zig Ziglar, Brian Tracy, um, Tony Robbins, all the TED Talks, all those kinds of resources. I'd already encountered those resources, but I just wasn't at a place to overcome the obstacles I framing what I had to offer. I mean, you know, YouTube's been around for, for uh, eight, ten 10 years now, I think. I've been on YouTube since 2008. I started doing like a video blog in August of 2008. So I've been online, but it's a matter of packaging things in a form, um, you know, in an educational form that people actually look at that way. So excuse of, well, I, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to get into speaking. I don't know how to get people to listen to me. Um, and it finally, you know, what, what clicked was when I started reading some of uh, Gary, Gary Vaynerchuk's books, which uh, thanks to Jeff Mazzella for turning me on to him. Um, Jeff Mazzella is a fellow in my uh, BNI group. If you never need anything done to upgrade a truck, Jeep, vehicle like that, bedliners, that kind of stuff, talk to Jeff Mazzella in New London. Northeast, uh, I should know this. I think it's Northeast Off-Road is his business name. Uh, great guy. And he turned me on to Gary Vaynerchuk, and so indirectly he's the reason why there is this why there is this, uh, not webinar, webcast. But so you need to think about, you know, when you encounter those kinds of obstacles, how you get around them. And, and you know, I have ADD, unmedicated, treated, but not medicated. So I can be distracted. So sometimes something will come up and uh, I'll be like, oh, yeah, so I'm going to start doing this training business. And, oh, what's this over here? Don't let that be you. And if it is you, it happens. Circle back to it later. You might end up circling back to it two years later. And uh, you know, for any video gamers out there, you'll you'll know the experience if you go to you go to fight a boss or beat a challenge, and you go go back out, try to get more equipment and weapons and level more and get more experience points until you're ready to come back and, and defeat this challenge. Something very similar happens in, in real life. All right. Next, uh, I got a question um, this week from Yvonne. And uh, she was asking about how to approach people at a networking event. So one of the challenges you run into at a networking event is let's say you're going to one and you've never been to it before. It's a new new group, or maybe you have been there a couple times, but you haven't really gotten a, a group of people that you know. So one of the challenges that you run into is you're going to look at this big room, and there's lots of people in it. I mean, if you're going to the Eastern Connecticut Chamber of Commerce, um, which is – which is one that I'm very actively involved in, they can have between 80 and 300 people. The last one had 300 at Mike's famous Harley Davidson. And you look around and everyone's talking to someone. There's very few people who are just standing there by themselves. So you think, oh, everyone here already knows each other and I'm the new person. So how am I possibly going to break into a conversation? Well, little secret. Yes, some of the people are know each other, mostly because they came in a group and they're talking to other people from their same company, which means they're not actually doing networking right because they're talking to people they already know and probably were talking to all day at the office. Um, so that's my first piece of advice. If you go to a networking event with people from the office, 
don't talk to them at the networking event. Talk to them at the office. Talk to the new people you're looking to meet at the networking event. But the other secret is, other than that, you are probably looking at strangers talking to each other. It just happens that they met a few minutes before you first talked to them. Oh, I have a message. Let's see if it's a question. Yeah, it's a question asking me if I've started. Yeah, I'm going to say to reload. See, that's the technical challenges. So I may move to a different platform from Hangouts because there seem to be some issues, like it doesn't start streaming when I hit broadcast. It just keeps showing you um, preview. So that runs into some issues that people want to watch me and can't, and that makes me sad. Although it does make me excited that I see that I have viewers and someone who I thought was watching isn't yet. So that's cool. What was I saying? I was talking about networking. So the people that you see at the networking event all talking to each other probably just met. Which means that if you were to approach a group of people, now some of them will just ignore you, but some of them will open up and be like, hi, how are you doing? Or during a pause in conversation, you can introduce yourself. And it's very simple to do so, um, especially if you see them by themselves, but even a couple people together, you walk up to them and you say, Hi, I'm Michael Whitehouse. Replace Michael Whitehouse with your own name, unless you are Michael Whitehouse. I know there's a few other Michael Whitehouses out there. Um, if your name is Michael Whitehouse, hello, good to meet you. Uh, I know there's one up in Amherst when I lived up there. He went to UMass a couple years after I did. Uh, there's also Michael Whitehouse, who is in, um, who's a horror writer in England, apparently. But, so say, hi, my name is Michael Whitehouse. Your name here. And then they will give you their name. And then you ask them, so what do you do, your name? Assuming their name is your name, which is an unusual name, but don't judge. And then they'll tell you what they do. Now, here's one of the keys. Once you have started talking, which, by the way, that is the secret to starting talking, walking up and saying something about the people went there to network, so they're not going to be like, hey, why are you interrupting me? I was busy networking, and then you came up and talked to me. That's kind of like saying that a pipe is clogged with water. That's what it's for, it's water to go through it. Purpose of a networking event is to network. So once you are talking to someone at the event, you may be thinking, well, well what am I going to say? What am I going to tell them? Here's the best part. The less you say, the more they're going to like you. So what you're going to do is you're going to say, so what do you do? And they're going to answer, presumably, unless they work for, you know, the CIA or something, which would make it very strange that they'd be at a networking event if they couldn't tell you what they're going to do. So they're either going to tell you what they do, or if they work for the CIA and are spy, they're going to tell you what the government told. But same thing. And you're going to listen. And you're going to ask questions and keep them talking. Now, as you're listening, you should be thinking about who do you know and what do you know that can help them with the problems that are coming across as they talk? Because most people, not that they're telling you their problems, but as they talk, they, they reveal needs. You know, simply, if they're in the nonprofit world, they're probably looking for volunteers for events. They're probably looking for sponsors for fundraisers. Um, if they're a car salesman, they're probably looking for people to buy cars. Um, they might be looking to meet mechanics or people who work in car rental shops or Whatever, and so as you're th as they're talking, what you should be thinking about is not what you're going to say next. You should be thinking about, you know, ways you might be able to help them. And in fact, one thing that we are trained in BNI with concept is to ask them, so who is your ideal referral? And most people are going to hear that question and go, huh? And so if you need to explain it, you can say, well, you know, if I if I happen to know someone who was the person you were looking to meet, the exact ideal person, the reason you came here, hoping you would meet this type of person, who would that person be? Um, and maybe they're looking for a customer, maybe they're looking for um, a connection, maybe looking for a city official, maybe looking for, as I said, sponsors, maybe they're looking for a mentor. 
they're looking, you know, everyone's looking for someone, um, someone to educate them. Maybe they're looking because they have a job where they've been forced to do sales and they have no sales background, and you can tell them about this fantastic weekly webcast you know about every Tuesday at 8 o'clock, taught by this guy named Michael Whitehouse, who's a handsome fellow, if I do say so myself. So I'm staring at my own face. It gets very distracting. Um, and <laughs> I just lost my train of thought. So, but, but seriously, what you're, you know, think about what you can offer them. Because the more you are able to give them, the, the more value you have to them. And then they are probably going to ask you, well, what do you do? And then they might turn around that same question which you provide them and say, well, who's your ideal referral? Who, who would you like to meet? How can I help you? Because you've already offered to help them. So that's the thing is, um, as, as I just in the uh, what's in it, you know, what's in it for me blog post, and I'll get back to that concept, that people are much more interested in themselves than they are in other people. You know, people want to know what they can get for themselves. And so by you simply giving them the chance to talk and giving them the chance to get what they want and offering to help them, now they are in a much more receptive mood to help you. So that's, that's really your goal is to build that, build that connection. Now, if you do find that there is some value here, if you think that either you have something to offer them or they have something to offer you, you're going to want to set a time to speak to them after the event. All right, think of networking kind of like speed dating. If you spend more than five, six, seven minutes talking to someone, the event's only 120 minutes usually. And generally, a third to half of people are gone by an hour to an hour and a half in. So you don't want to spend too much time talking to one person because there's a lot of people there, and the more people you can speak to, the more opportunities you're going to find. So take their card, say, you know, do you mind if I give you a call? We can meet for coffee because I'd really like to talk to you in greater detail. So that allows you to meet a great number of people. So that is the quick version of how to operate at a networking event. Um, if there are any questions about that, uh, most of you possibly have known me on Facebook because I'm pretty sure it's the main place I was advertising this. So feel free to send me a Facebook message. I'm just checking right now to see if we have any new ones. We don't. Um, so feel free to send me a Facebook message if you have any questions about that since that's apparently the only way I can be reached through this, this uh, piece of technology we are currently using. Um, it brings me to the concept of WIIFM. I talked about it a bit, talked about this a bit last week. I don't know how many of you watched last week's show, so I'll touch on it briefly. WIIFM stands for What's In It For Me. So, here, I can even put that on the screen like this. Oh, unless I click the X button and make my draw app go away. And that makes it work very poorly. So, see, I can do this. Nope, I just put sample text on the screen, didn't I? Yes, I did. I really am computer literate. I like to think I'm computer literate. I was once computer literate. Um, I can, like, write software and all kinds of stuff, but stuff like this is just, I don't know. Anyway, what's in it for me? is the concept. So the, the joke is WIFM is everyone's favorite radio station. So you need to consider that everyone is always thinking about what's in it for themselves. You're always thinking about what's in it for you when you decide if you're going to watch this video. You were thinking, you know, there's something in this video for me. Either I'm going to learn something about how to build my business um, and, you know, learn about sales and networking and, and how to meet more people and make more connections. Or I find Michael Whitehouse's voice and or face really attractive, and I just want to spend an hour looking at it and listening to it, which, you know, that's cool, too, whatever, whatever floats your boat. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm still mostly speaking to the, the sales training audience because um, I'm married. Sorry, ladies, gentlemen. I don't want to judge. Um, I think my indicator said, hey, I've lost, like, half my viewers. Sorry. Uh, <laughs> but what's in it for me? People are looking for, you know, their own. and, and it's not like a greedy, selfish kind of thing. It's not like everyone has an angle. It's simply when you do something, you do it because it makes you happy. Um, if you donate to charity, you donate to charity because it makes you happy, or at least it makes you feel less guilty. Um, 
or maybe get someone off your back, which makes you happy. Even to take a more absurd example, let's take mug. Someone pulls a gun on you and says, give me your money. Well, you don't want to give them your money, but you don't want them to shoot you. So what's in it for you is that they don't shoot you if you give them their money. So that's what's in it for you. If there's no angle for you, then you're looking for the next thing. You know, why am I still here? Well, you know that about you, but remember it about everyone else. Anyone you talk to is always thinking about what's in it for them. So, you know, an example that I give in the blog, which I'll summarize, is that let's say that, that you, and I'm sure you've all seen this if you're on social media, the person they just started with, um, Beachogenic Saluka Way, I think is what I called it, to mash up a couple different names. And, and they make the post about, hey, guys, I just started with Beachogenics and Look Away, and, and I would love for you to get involved with me and join my team because I want to make the biggest team in America, and, and it's going to be super successful, and they're going to fly me to Tahiti if I can do this, and it's going to be amazing. So please join me. Well, what's in it for you? Yeah, it's great. Your, your friend will fly to Tahiti, and they'll be super successful, and you'll be... What? what? What's in it for me? However, if instead they, um, they post something like, hey, I just started using Beachogenic Saluka Way, and I feel great, and I've lost 20 pounds, and it's a fantastic natural product. I'm really excited about it, and I'd like to share it with any of my friends who could help. Um, I know some of you guys have been trying to lose weight, so, um, you know, join me for this this online event that we're doing or come to this event or come to the party or whatever. That's the kind of thing that you are much more likely to respond to because there's something in it for you. You know, if you're looking to lose weight, you're looking to get healthier, well, then now that that itch is a scratch that you have. This scratches sorry, that scratch is an itch that you have. It gives so when you're talking to someone, always think about it in terms of why would they possibly want to say yes? You know, if, if you're talking to someone at a networking event and you're thinking, wow, this person could really help me out, um, then it, it, you really want to talk to them more later. You don't want to say, hey, I think you could really help me. Could we meet up later? Maybe more. I think we have a lot of things to talk about. I think that, um, you know, we have a lot to gain from each other. Let's meet up and talk more later. That's going to work a lot better than... You know, you can help me. It's it's more. I think I can help you. I think I have some people I can introduce you to. I think I have some some ideas that might help you. And so that's the W I I F M concept. It's a very difficult concept. Even I myself will occasionally, you know, occasionally slip into thinking about myself and not what the other person wants. But I generally try to maintain an attitude of of thinking about what I can give. And that what I can get will eventually come, you know, come back on its own. Next thing I want to talk about. So as I said, Gary Vaynerchuk is someone I've been recently introduced to, not personally, um, but he is a, a YouTube personality. Uh, he started out in the world of wine selling. And uh, he, he has a very successful, I don't know if he still does it. Um, he either has or had a very successful show called Wine Library TV where he talked about wine. And through that success, he built a social media consulting company because when you're really successful on social media you're doing anything, you are then able to consult with anyone else on social media who wants to be really successful. And one of his books is called Jab, 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 Right Hook. It's a great concept. Um, it's actually a concept I've been talking about, but he made a much better term for it. And the idea is giving before you get, giving value before you ask for anything. And it partic particularly applies to online, but I mean, it applies everywhere, really. So I work for Minuteman Press. I sell printing. And I can approach you and say, hey, you do some printing. Can I give you a quote? And that's, that's a bit of value up front. You know, at some point, you're going to need to do quotes for these, these products. Just give me a sample. I can give you a quote. That's easy. If the quote's better, phenomenal. You're going to buy from me. If it's not better, you're not going to buy from me because that's all we're talking about. 
But what I really try to do is try to give even more value, like say a web show in which I help you build your business and help build marketing. I would hope that if you're in my audience and you're learning from me and you need a set of business cards or flyers or brochures, you're going to talk to me first and you know, we at least talk about, talk about what kind of value and kind of pricing we could do. But there's all kinds of different ways that I can provide that value. I can make, um, you know, I know a lot of people in the area, so I can provide that value to potential clients by making introductions, by, um, if they're a nonprofit, by helping them find sponsors and helping them find resources. If they're in any other form of business, I can help them find similar companies or complementary companies or supplementary companies that can help them to build their business in various ways. So I, I'm always looking for ways that I can help my clients beyond just the printing. I mean, we do a great job with printing. We're, we're very, you know, we, we can meet any deadline if we need to. Um, our prices are very reasonable, all that stuff. But that's, that's almost the baseline for a high quality company. You need to go beyond that. So when it says jab, 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 right hook, the jabs are gives. They're something you are giving. So the environment, it might be a video like this where, where you teach about your, your particular field. Um, it might be links. Just looking at my side screen here and it's showing me getting up and I didn't just get up. All right, hopefully you guys are actually seeing me on here and not seeing what that's showing. Hopefully it's working. Of course, if it's not working, then you wouldn't be hearing me say, hopefully it's working, so I can't like ask you to have a message. Um, but actually, let's uh, I'm gonna throw something out here on the screen, because I imagine most of you have phones, even if you don't have Facebook. So, yes. So if you're watching this, if you're getting this live, send me a text message. Let me know. Even if you saw a same text message that says, I see it, that would be great. Um, but if you have a question or a thought, I'd love to get that too, to get some, get some feedback into it. Um, but just to make sure that this is actually going out live, you can actually see what I'm actually saying because I don't get any feedback from the computer and that makes me worried I am actually talking to myself, which, you know, I've been doing a video blog since 2008 and just talking to myself. But if I'm doing this live, I kind of want people to be able to see it. But I'm going to keep talking. But please send me numbers over here. Send me a message. Send me a text. Let me know that uh, you know that you can that you can see me. Hey, hello, Anne. Thank you for sending me a message. Let me know you can see me. Now I know it's working. Fantastic. Other people can send me messages too if you want. Jab, 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 right hook. That's what I was talking about. Um, so, and again, that's a very Gary Vaynerchuk's term. Uh, it's the name of his book. Um, I'm sure it's a trademark term, but I can certainly talk about it in reference to his book. I didn't make it up, so hopefully he won't sue me. I'm just giving him some exposure. Uh, you can find him all over YouTube, by the way. And uh, I have not read Jab, 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 Right Hook. I have, however, read Crush It, which is a phenomenal book as well that talks about leveraging the internet as it is to, to be successful. Um, but so jabs can be a number of things. Jabs could be sharing things that you find online. So it's called curating content, which is uh, simply, I do, I do a lot of that on my Facebook page. Um, lately I've been doing a lot of that with Bernie Sanders related stuff, but I try to share other things as well. Um, see a, a good you know, motivational image, you share that. Um, if you are, if you're doing something health related and you share articles about being healthier, about exercising, about diet and all that kind of stuff, you share that. Um, and you share regularly so people get to know you as someone who shares useful, helpful things, news articles, um, other articles. Make sure they're accurate if you're going to share them. Snopes before you share if you're anywhere in any kind of controversial area. Um, be very much discrediting yourself if you share something and someone can say, uh, that's not true. 
And if you do share something and someone says it's not true and can back that up and you can verify by checking Snopes or other independent sources. And I know Snopes is not entirely reliable in some areas, but by and large for most things you're posting, it's a pretty decent way to do it. If you determine that something you have shared is not accurate, take it down. Delete it before people see it. You know, you don't need to. You don't need to leave things up for falling down. Um, you know, it's basically the same as issuing a retraction. So, oh, I have a text message. It's working. Ish. Hi, April. Good to see that you are watching. Um, so it's working. Ish. If you're missing any part of this, um, you it, this is being recorded and put onto YouTube. Uh, afterwards, so you can watch it again if you like. So, offer the you know the jabs are offering that kind of value so that people want to watch. The right hook is when you actually go for the sale. It's when you ask for the money. And what Gary Vaynerchuk says is that if when you go for the right hook, go for it. Don't don't pussyfoot around. Don't be like, oh, well, I'm not really selling you something. I'm just kind of talking about something. And oh, can I have your money? If you're asking them to buy something, say, I would like you to buy something. Um, possibly even lay it out there and say, listen, I know uh, I've been providing a lot of content. Hopefully you found it valuable. I'd really appreciate my book. Would consider buying this thing I do online. Um, would consider subscribing to my page. Whatever it is. Um, and... Speaking of which, if you have not liked my page, Michael Whitehouse Training on Facebook, please do so. Hopefully you have enjoyed this video already and found it valuable, so you should like my page so that you can find about other things. There's my very gentle, gentle right hook. Liking a page is really big. <laughs> you build up with the jab so that you built that value and then you go for the right hook. If you don't have any right hooks, then people love you, but they don't buy from you because you never ask them to. If you don't have any jabs, then you're just that annoying person online saying, hey, buy my stuff. Buy my stuff. Nobody wants to buy that person's stuff. That, that's too much. Too much. You know, everyone likes to buy. Nobody likes to be sold. So, but, you know, when you offer, offer the value, then ask for the, ask for the buy and people are willing to do it people understand that you are putting your time and energy i know everyone thinks everyone talks about oh the internet everyone expects it to be free everything should be free in the, the modern world it's not really true i know a lot of people are perfectly happy to to pay for things that they value from people they know and care about and by know and care about i don't mean close friends and relatives i mean someone they get to know someone they've been watching on youtube for a while and they feel a kinship with um, someone that they know from from Twitter, from Facebook, from Snapchat. Um, Snapchat, by the way, I finally installed it. Uh, MG Whitehouse is my Snapchat name, so you can snap or chat or whatever me. I understand it mechanically. I understand kind of the market it's for. I don't like it. But, you know, if your market's using it, you should use it. Go where fish where the fish are. Um, I'm really distractible tonight. I apologize. But, you know, the video's free, so you can't complain too much. I also wanted to speak seven steps of the sale. Um, different thing to really, difficult thing to really speak too briefly about. But I believe that this tool right here will allow me to actually write things on the screen. Let's find out if that's true. Take the seven steps of the sale. I can put it up here. And, hey, look at that. Seven steps of sale. Hopefully you can see that. Um, so now yeah, there's different trainers. We'll talk about different steps. Some people say five steps. Some say seven. Some say 12. Some say 26. Some say 104. Um, no trainer says 104. That would be the whole book. It would be like two pages per step. Be crazy. But there's seven steps to the sales process. Now, depending on what you're doing, um, the, the steps may be longer or shorter, more or less significant, but I'm going to briefly go through them 
Uh, I'm going to make a blog post about them as well for, for reference. But briefly, here are the seven steps. So the first step is, if I could spell this, prospecting. So before you can do anything else, you need to know two. Um, back in 2014, I tried to start a marketing consultancy. And honestly, this is the step where I really tripped up. I didn't have enough people to talk to. And in fact, prospecting is um, many of the endeavors that I've had where I ran into trouble. Prospecting was the, the step where I really, really failed. Because prospecting gives you the number of people you need to talk to. So most in most sales fields, you can work your numbers backwards if you're doing any kind of outside sales. You're gonna sell a certain percentage of the people that you see, um, a certain percentage of people that you have appointments with will actually be there. A certain percentage of people you ask for appointments will make an appointment. Um, so based on that, you can compute, okay, if I want to make 50 sales a month, I'm going to need to talk to 1,000 people. Uh, of course, the problem is if you don't know 1,000 people, then that's not going to work. You'll be calling 50 people 20 times each, not the same as calling 1,000 people. So. That's one thing I always need to consider if you don't have enough activity, you may not be prospecting enough, you may not be encountering enough. Now, for some fields, if you are, say, a vendor selling at a booth, prospecting is to come marketing, which is another uh, another category beyond the scope of this discussion tonight, but uh, I can get into it next week if people are interested. But if you are doing any kind of outside sales, and to some degree, the prospecting really happens when you're finding Finding the events. This is the, the challenging thing about making a single model that covers everything is that sometimes it's iterative. So these seven steps are how you get into a fair, and then the seven steps are also what you do with an individual uh, individual sale. But prospecting is where cold calling would fall if, if that's uh, field, um, and it's basically finding the people to talk to. Now this can be networking. So going to networking events, which we talked. If you missed that, then when I post the video, go back to like minute five or 10 or something like that is where we talk about networking, um, you know, asking people for referrals, those kinds of things. And sometimes it can be cold calling depending on what it is. You know, if you sell printing, you're pretty effective because most businesses need printing. If you sell jewelry, cold calling is probably not a very effective strategy. I don't recommend trying to cold call people with your jewelry because then you're pretty close to panhandling. Hi. Got some jewelry, you want some jewelry? How about you, you want some jewelry? Would you like some jewelry? Yeah, you don't, don't do that. So step two, so now you know who to contact. Well, now you need to talk to them. So that gives us, da, 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 da. ding. Great sound effects, don't you think? Appointment setting. So you appointment setting is having the time, space, attention to be able to make your presentation. Depending on what it is, determines how much time and space you need. If you're selling jewelry, you can have them at the counter and then you're pretty good there. If you are selling um, something simple like a set of business cards or flyers, you can probably do it, you know, at the front counter of their business. If you're discussing a complex mailing campaign, uh, if you're discussing a, an IT contract, if you're discussing the sale of 747s or major real estate, you probably want to set a time when you're going to be meeting quietly in a room with all the materials you need and everything in place. So you've set your appointment. Hopefully they showed up for the appointment. And that brings us to step three, rapport building. Because what's entrepreneurship without a funny French word? It's another French word, but as George Bush said, it's too bad the French don't have a word for entrepreneur. I guess the French also don't have a word for rapport. Um, so rapport building, yes, rapport is a French word. That's the joke. In case you didn't didn't get the joke, I was making. Rapport building is is the smoozing. Um, it's the chatting. You know, some people say I like to get right down to business. Well, that's a good way to not sell things. People like to do business with people they know and trust. So ideally, you have any of them. But unfortunately, when you get down to, this is reversed, prospecting, there it is. It's very hard to point to things on the screen. When you get to prospecting here, 
you will find um, that you have to talk to a lot of strangers unless you know a lot of people. I have 1,300 friends on my Facebook page. It's not enough. I still do a lot of cold calling because just the people I know aren't enough. You really need to work with thousands and thousands of people. So the rapport building is the ability to make a friend, a stranger into a friend quickly. I talked during the networking section about the idea of um, listening, doing a lot of listening, asking questions like you'll talk because people not only are interested in their own interests, they also enjoy the sound of their own voice. That's, that's my joke and it's not a joke at all. I like the sound of my own voice, which is why I like speaking and teaching because I get to selfishly talk a lot and I'm actually helping people and doing what I'm supposed to be doing. It's great. Although I honestly, I do prefer working in an environment where like people can talk back and ask questions. It's kind of weird to just sit here and talk to a screen for an hour, but I do. It works. Um, let's check. Sue saying sent me a message. No, no one did. It said, um, So report billing, you ask, ask them questions. I saw the go-to question I always used was, got any big plans for the weekend? Um, if you're at a weekend fair, don't use that question. They'll be like, yeah, I'm going to a fair. I'm there right now, right here. But most of the sales we did were during the week or Saturday morning. So when I sold insurance, so I would say, got any big plans for the weekend? Every person that you meet is within five days of a weekend because every person you meet uses the same seven day a week that you do. And if they don't, you either have nothing to talk to them about or you have a lot to talk to them about. Like, well, how do they work with this non seven day week? I am curious. But so they're gonna say something. Now you're always gonna encounter those people who just won't talk to you, won't answer and be like, got any big plans for the weekend? Nope. Oh, it's just gonna be hanging out a uh, quiet weekend? Yup. Not much you can do with them. Um, there is something you could say that would get them going, but without clues, it's kind of hard to guess, and you might just want to roll ahead and hope for the best. But most people will answer. You know, got any big plans for the weekend? Oh yeah, I'm going to a, um, I'm going to be emceeing at a charity bowling event. Which, by the way, I'm actually going to be emceeing at a charity bowling event at Spare Time Lanes on Sunday from three to six. Um, if anyone's in the Groton area and wants to bowl and help a good cause, um, but yeah. You, they're going to have something. Oh, I got to mow the lawn. I've got to take the kids to, to soccer practice. Not only will this get them talking, it will provide information. So like with what I just said, now you know that I work with different events. You can ask, oh, who, who's the charity for? Who's it raising money for? Do you do a lot of events? Um, do you do a lot of emceeing? Uh, if you don't know about the thing they're talking about, don't guess it won't help um so if you're not a a geek sci-fi fan and you say hey you got any big plans for the weekend and they say oh yeah i'm going to say oh comic-con are you into batman if the answer is yes they got lucky and if the answer is no oh awkward very awkward but if you don't know anything about it just honestly be curious oh comic-con i've never been there um, I always see it, you know, I know the news covers it. Um, you know, what, what, what goes on at Comic-Con? Because it looks like a lot of fun. I've never been there, um, but I've always been curious about it. And be honestly curious and let them tell you about it. And once they realize that you're not, you know, it, it helps if you are actually curious. And all kinds of different industries when, you know, in the rapport building process. Because you get to meet all kinds of fascinating people. So once you get past that and kind of it bleeds in, you're going to come to the needs analysis. And this is where you find out what they need. What each do they have that your product can scratch? Um, there, in the report, you're going to pick up some needs. Um, depending on what you're selling, you may have a formalized needs analysis process. Um, and sometimes you don't. It all depends on, on what it is what industry you're in, but you want to find out what, what they need. Um, so, you know, if you are selling insurance, you need to know, you know, do they have kids? How much money do they make? Um, 
Do they have any medical conditions, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if you are selling consulting services, you need to know what it is their, their business is lacking, what their pain points are, what the things are that you know they really hate about running a business if they were, say, a business owner. Um, but whatever it is, you know, there, there's some, some itch that your product can hopefully scratch. And if you don't know what it is, you can't help them. Um, because the next thing you're going to need to do is... Is that right? Yes. Presentation. So now you've built rapport. They're, they're listening to you. You've done a needs analysis. They understand, um, you know, you understand what they need. You are now going to present, and your presentation is going to explain why exactly what you have matches what they need. Hopefully you have a variety of things, and what you have really does match what they need. Excuse me a second. Um, you know, what you have really done. But as, if it's nearby, you can mold your presentation. You know, when I was selling cars, if someone was talking about how their children mean everything to them, I'm not going to say, well, well, check this baby out. It's got 287 million horsepower and it can go 160 bazillion miles an hour. Um, and even, you know, even if I'm talking about the handling, I'm not going to say, you can take this baby up to 120 miles an hour and be zipping around curves, and, you know, it'll be great. If I'm talking about the handling, I'm going to say, this car has sport-tuned suspension, and what that means is, barrel falls off a truck in front of you, and you jerk the wheel to get around it, you're going to maintain a grip on the road, so you can keep control even at highway speeds when you have to do an emergency maneuver. Same feature, sport suspension, but I'm tying it to their needs, safety of their family. So after the presentation comes a close. So if you have done, um, you know, if you have done the uh, the presentation well, I see this. I believe will actually let me draw something. So ideally, you want your sales process to be an upside down triangle, which happens, I don't think it drew that. Now, where's my triangle? Okay, in theory, I'm about to draw an upside down triangle. Ta-da, okay. Your sales process should be an upside down top of the triangle here. This is your report building these analysis. This is where you're gonna put most of your effort. And then, as you get down, you're gonna get to the presentation. The presentation doesn't have to be too long, so you already know their needs, you're gonna match them. And then the close is the little tiny portion down here at the bottom because you know what they need. You, you have presented how your product matches what they need and bada boom, naturally, you know, you've established what their budget is, you've established what you can do, you've established what they need and they all these things match. So we might as well go ahead with this, shouldn't we? Um, whereas the other way to do it, and unfortunately this is what a lot of, uh, a lot of car salesmen do, is the right side up triangle. Drawing this thing is hard and I'm not an artist, sorry. Um, where, it's over here, there we go. The rapport building, so I'm sure you've had the experience if you've ever bought a car, you walk onto the lot and the rapport building is, hi, I'm John, welcome to ABC Motors. Needs analysis, so you're looking for a car, what kind of car are you looking for? And you say, uh, oh, I'm looking for, for a small car, maybe a, maybe a Ford Focus. Presentation is, oh, Ford Focus, you want a Ford Focus? I got a Ford Focus right over here. Let's go drive it. Drive the car. Close. Now, the close is going to be the wide part because they haven't built any value. All right, so this car is going to be this much money. Oh, oh, what do you want for less money? Well, let me go to the manager. Let me see what I can do. Okay, you're in luck. We got a deal going on. We got this. We got that. That's where all the games come in because they haven't established the value. The correct way to sell anything is build a rapport. When I was selling cars, I'd bring someone to sit with, my, sit with me at my desk for 10 minutes before we even started talking about cars. I would find out what they did for work. I'd find out about their kids. I'd find out about their hobbies. And yeah, there's some people they don't want to do that. They want to get straight down to business. They want to keep control. And you can still build rapport while you're going through the process. But I'd build that rapport so when it came to these analysis and say, so you know, what are you really looking for? 
and I learn, you know, that they they have kids, don't have kids, and they uh, travel every weekend, and they need room for suitcases or this or that. So when it comes to the presentation, um, I can say, you know, well, this car is five star safety rated. So when Billy and Susie are in the car, you're going to feel comfortable about that, or it's got electronic stability control, which I love talking about electronic stability control. Every car after 2012 has it. If a car salesman ever tells you this car's got electronic stability control. Yes, mandated by the federal government in 2012. They all have it. But when I talk about electronic stability control, I can tie it in to, you know, how it's going to keep the kids safe or on those long trips. If you, you know, you get a little bit drowsy and um, that's not going to keep you awake, but uh, out of trouble or help you stay out of trouble. And then the close comes in and we say, you know, well, clearly this is the right car. It matches everything you're looking for. You told me that your budget was $12,000. The car is eleven five. So uh, is there any reason why you can't go forward with this? So that gives us the the screen's reversed, by the way. That's why I look like I'm having trouble matching things. So that gives us the right side up triangle and not the, the upside down triangle instead of the right side up triangle. And that brings us to step seven, follow-up. So follow-up. Follow-up will be different in different fields. Um, in car sales, that's the delivery and insurance. That includes uh, the underwriting process and getting all the forms and writing it up. Um, follow-up is everything after they say yes or no, um, because there's still some more you can do after they say no. No, sometimes it's maybe later. Um, so follow-up includes asking for referrals. Um, so is there anyone else you know who's looking for a car? Um, who else do you know who might be interested in discussing life insurance? Sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Follow-up is also sending them a thank you note or calling them to make sure that they're happy with the car or whatever. You know, Again, if you're selling something at a fair, you probably don't have the contact information to follow up with them. Um, but if you're doing a larger sale, you probably do have that. And, and in some businesses, sales are recurring. So follow-up involves contacting them, making sure they're happy, and that eventually loops back to appointment setting. Um, because, you know, as you guys know this person, you build a relationship, your rapport is already built. That's how you maintain a relationship going through the, the follow-up phase. So those are the seven steps to the sale. Um, let's do a final check to see if we have any other questions that people have sent in. Looks like we do not have any more questions um, so with that I'm going to wrap it up but uh, thank you very much for watching the second webinar not that we call it that we call it a webcast or Michael Whitehouse live so I'm Michael Whitehouse thank you very much for watching that'll do